Well, if, if you have a barn, you know, and you want to paint it red, you know, if you put a thin paint of red paint, it may not be quite red enough. If you put two or three, then it really looks red. After that, if you add more red, it doesn't make much difference. That's Dr. William Happer using an analogy of painting a barn red to explain why adding more CO2 to the atmosphere will have a minimal effect on global temperature. This is one of the more technical and superficially convincing arguments made by climate contrarians, and because of this, it's worth addressing in some detail. But before we do, some of you might be wondering who this distinguished gentleman is, and why he's talking about CO2. William Happer is a renowned American physicist who is best known for his research on atomic physics, optics, and spectroscopy. He is also one of the few scientists who rejects the scientific consensus on climate change. Now, I could go into detail about his role in fostering doubt over the conclusions of climate science, but I don't want this video to become a character assassination. And if you're interested, there's plenty of information online. However, it is worth noting that despite Happer's assertions that climate scientists have got it wrong, he has never published peer-reviewed climate research, which is a little odd, because if I was a renowned scientist with access to some of the world's best research institutions, and and I thought a major area of scientific understanding was seriously flawed, the first thing I would do would be to conduct research to demonstrate why. But for whatever reason, Happer hasn't done that. And since scientific conclusions are drawn from the weight of evidence, and not the opinions of scientists, no matter how esteemed they may be, we are forced to evaluate Happer's claims against the research of others. Now, over the years, Happer has made a number of claims about climate science, many of which are directly at odds with the published research in the area. These include the claim that global warming has paused, that climate models have been wildly inaccurate, and that continued rises in atmospheric CO2 will have a net beneficial effect on agriculture. I've addressed all of these in detail in other videos, which I've linked in the description, so I won't go over them again here. But one of Happer's more outlandish claims is that we are currently in a CO2 famine. We're in a CO2 famine. Famine, famine. We have too little CO2. <laughs> it seems that Happer thinks that returning the planet to the Cambrian, or perhaps the Cretaceous, when sea levels were hundreds of feet above those of today, would be an ideal scenario. Maybe he thinks we're in a dinosaur drought too. And while he's right that modern CO2 levels are indeed much lower than they were for much of the geological past, the ecosystems on the planet today, and our entire species, have adapted to thrive in the conditions as they currently are or at least as they were before we started burning billions of tons of fossilized plant juice. But ultimately, this argument, indeed all his arguments, are built on the foundational assumption that increasing atmospheric CO2 has little to no effect on global temperature. If this were the case, then elevated CO2 may well be beneficial to plants and agriculture, as it would increase photosynthesis and we wouldn't have to worry about the heat stress, forest fires, desertification, unpredictable seasonality, droughts, floods and rising sea levels which come with global warming. So this is the claim we'll focus on today. But before we do, let's hear the argument in Happer's own words. You know, I know a lot about CO2 compared to most climate scientists, because we make CO2 lasers, you know, and CO2 is a very interesting molecule, and uh, the particular uh, uh, mode of CO2 that contributes to global warming, the CO2 is a rod, and it bends like this, up and down, up and down, and it's that bending motion that causes uh, the global warming. But that is, is such a strong absorption that it's saturated now. So as you add more CO2, most of what you can do has already been done. There's still a little addition, but not very much. Can you explain that to me in a little greater depth? What do you mean it's already been done? Well, if, to, if you have a barn, you know, and you want to paint it red, you know, if you put a thin paint of red paint, it may not be quite red enough. If you put two or three, then it really looks red. After that, if you add more red, it doesn't make much difference. And so that's sort of what CO2 is doing now, that most of the easy absorption has been done. Still with us? Great. But in case any of you dozed off, Happer's argument is basically that CO2 is already absorbing all the heat that it is capable of absorbing, so adding more won't increase heat absorption, and therefore increasing CO2 in the atmosphere will have a negligible effect on global temperature. That's what Happer says, but what does the science have to say? The idea that the greenhouse effect of CO2 is saturated was first proposed by a Swedish chap named Knut Angström back when climate science was in its infancy and moustaches were compulsory. 
Another Swede named Svante Arrhenius had recently suggested that rising CO2 levels could drive global warming, but this was still hotly contested. And so, to test the effects of different levels of CO2 on temperature, Angstrom got his assistant to perform an experiment. He filled a tube with carbon dioxide and sent infrared radiation through it to measure how much was absorbed. He then cut the amount of CO2 in the tube by a third and found that the amount of radiation absorbed barely changed. Because of this, the scientific community at the time concluded that the CO2 in the atmosphere was already absorbing as much heat as was possible, and so adding more wouldn't make much difference to global temperature. But there were a couple of things which Angstrom didn't know when he did his experiments. You see, he was measuring the heat absorption of CO2 at the planet's surface, where the air is relatively warm and air pressure is relatively high. He then took his results and assumed that they applied all the way through the atmosphere right up to the edge of space. But the atmosphere isn't one homogeneous block, it's more like multiple separate layers all piled on top of each other. In order to escape to space, heat energy has to move through each successive layer. If there were no greenhouse gases to block the way, heat would travel straight through all of them unimpeded. But as soon as you add greenhouse molecules, you create obstacles. Every time a photon of heat energy encounters a greenhouse molecule, it is absorbed and then either radiated in a random direction or transferred into velocity during collisions with other gas molecules. Effectively, greenhouse gases bounce heat around the atmosphere like a giant pinball machine. As you rise in altitude, the air gets colder and less dense, and greenhouse molecules become fewer and further between, until eventually we reach a layer so thin and so sparsely populated by greenhouse gases that heat can escape into space. And it's the heat loss from these upper layers that determines how much heat is retained by the atmosphere. So what does this mean for Angstrom's findings? Well, even if every single photon of heat energy radiated by the Earth was immediately absorbed by a CO2 molecule near the planet's surface, the heat still has to travel through all the layers above, and adding more CO2 creates more obstacles for them to get through. The more obstacles there are, the harder it becomes for the heat to escape into space, and the warmer the atmosphere becomes. Kind of. I'm simplifying here. The point is, the absorption of heat in the lower layers of the atmosphere, the thing which Angstrom was measuring, is much less important than the absorption of heat in the upper layers. And while he was right that the CO2 at the surface is already absorbing basically all the heat that it can, in the upper layers of the atmosphere that's simply not the case. At altitudes where the air is so thin that heat from below can slip through, adding more CO2 makes a big difference. It becomes much harder for heat to escape to space, and this restriction of heat loss causes heat to accumulate in all the layers of the atmosphere, which in turn causes them to warm up. In other words, adding more CO2 to the atmosphere absolutely does cause global warming, regardless of saturation near the surface, and it's not the trivial thing that Happer makes it out to be. His barn analogy only works if you assume that the atmosphere is a single homogeneous entity, which is uniform from top to bottom. But in reality, there are multiple barns, layers, and while the ones closest to us might be covered in red paint, as Happer proposes, the ones furthest from us the most important ones have barely been touched by the paintbrush. Now, at the beginning of the 20th century, Angstrom couldn't have known this. The airplane hadn't been invented yet, so we can hardly blame him for not understanding the radiative properties of the upper atmosphere. Besides, he had better things to do, like rocking a banging moustache. But everything changed in the 1940s when high-altitude bombing prompted the military to fund research into radiation in the upper atmosphere. And it was this research which finally put an end to the scientific debate over whether CO2 could drive global warming. By the 1950s, moustaches were a thing of the past, and the evidence that CO2 could drive warming was so substantial that it was no longer controversial. And yet, despite this, William Happer, who would have been an adolescent at the time, apparently never got the memo. Now, I get it. Teenagers aren't exactly known for staying up to date with the latest science. I was too busy hanging out in garden tents, building volcano hats, and just generally being an awkward nerd. But Happer's had his whole adult life to catch up with the science, and yet he still insists on repeating a hundred-year-old argument which was debunked over half a century ago. And because of outspoken public figures like Happer, who repeatedly make claims which are totally at odds with the overwhelming body of scientific literature, we are now in a situation where the public discourse on climate change is, in the case of this argument, 70 years behind the scientific discourse. 
We have literally wasted decades. Well, thanks for wasting my time tonight. Now, before I wrap this up, let's address the inevitable comments I'm going to get from Hapa fans. I assume that most of them probably stopped watching as soon as I started critiquing their beliefs. But if any of you are still here, hi, how are you doing? You'll probably have a few predictable objections to this video, so let's go through them. First, you'd probably like to tell me how respected and credentialed Hapa is and how he would destroy me in a debate. Maybe you're right, but fortunately for me, scientific conclusions are not drawn from debates between individuals, they are drawn from evidence. And while Happer's opinions might resonate with your pre-existing beliefs, they are completely contradicted by scientific research. Citing his credentials, which, let me remind you, do not include any climate expertise at all, is an appeal to authority, not a logically sound argument. Second, you probably want to know why I feel I'm qualified to criticise such a well-respected physicist. Well, I'm just a geologist, and though I have a master's degree in climate change, my credentials and my opinions really don't matter for exactly the reason I just mentioned. What matters is evidence. The science presented in this video isn't my opinion. It reflects the conclusions of peer-reviewed scientific literature, some of which I've cited in the description. If you have a problem with it, then feel free to publish your own counter-evidence in a response paper. Strangely, that's something Happer has never done. And finally, if you find yourself irritated by this video but unable to engage with any of the points mentioned, then feel free to insult my manner, the way I speak, my presumed arrogance, or my beautiful moustache. Surprise me! Be creative with your insults. I'll take it as a tacit admission of cognitive dissonance or evidence that you can't rationally engage with opposing views. Right, now that's out the way, it should be very easy to identify who did and didn't watch the video through to the end, and we can all have a laugh at the angry trolls in the comments. But for the rest of you non-angry folk, I hope you've enjoyed watching, and if you did, then don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you can be notified whenever I upload. I really appreciate your continued support. Thanks for watching, and until next time, goodbye. You know, I know a lot about CO2 compared to most climate scientists.